Hello, this is Will Faber from Art to Ride, and today we're looking at the first submission by Emily with the horse Musa. Um, this is a horse that I worked at a clinic in Norway last summer, and this is what you're seeing here, a little clip of. He came in the arena, she's riding him in double bridle, it's very hard to hold back. Um, he just wanted to kind of run all the time. You can see how very hollow he is. He'd never done this kind of work before. If you look at this photograph, you can clearly see, or video rather, you can see his hind leg kind of falling out behind him. The head is up in the air. He's kind of pulling himself along by his shoulders, if you will. You can see the underside of the neck bulging out. You can also see the complete drop in the in the saddle there behind the withers. So this shows this horse has never developed correctly. This horse, however, ran or, or trotted 40 races before being retired for not being fast enough. Should get a reward for just being sound enough to do 40 races. But uh, anyway, he's coming along really, really nice. He's only nine years old, and I think he's going to have a, a really nice uh, future here going on now that Emily's got him so going so well. So this was just a little clip of the very first time we worked him. He just kind of wanted to be fast and kind of run along, pulling with his shoulders. And as she says here, tempted not to want to pull on the reins. Now, he's not going too, too fast here, but he was really even quite faster than this. And here he's already beginning to stretch. We'd already done the work in hand and things. <laughs> As you said, it's like he wants to start a fight. You know, a lot of horses uh, have been fought with by people. I mean, they kind of, especially if they learn to evade the contact by virtue of doing it, then of course they've won the day. So the biggest thing there is always just being sure the horse never leaves the ring without being calm. When we have these kind of horses that want to run, sometimes we have to keep them in the ring a long time. That doesn't mean they have to be running around. It means they have to be calm. They have to have calmed down before they leave the arena. Always remember that calmness is something that we have to train for and the very first thing that we actually train for. So, for instance, working a baby, as soon as they calm down, boom, we're done for the day. Now, some of them start out rather calm. And that's a good thing, but the ones that are of a hotter nature do not, and we have to just simply wait for them to calm down a little bit before we ever leave the ring with them. But Emily's done a really good job with this horse, as we'll see. We had done the work in hand with this horse here before she got on. And just a moment here, we're going to see a little more of uh, what she's doing now. So first here we're going to take a couple of looks at what he looks like now. His back is certainly improving, certainly flattened behind the withers there. You can see those old white marks on the withers. That's where the horse was sore at some point in his life and wore all the hair down to where it grew back white. Something always to look for when we go out looking to buy horses, if they have any of those on their backs anywhere. It tells you they've been sore in the back before. But this horse already looks much, much better. And here we come to the work in hand section of this. And already look how nice this is starting to look. Emily's doing a great job here with him. That's such a wonderful rhythm, slow and deep, and exactly where you want the horse to be. From, so from here, you can build everything else in time. And this is really good. This was quite a hard-mouthed horse. Now, I notice she's now working the horse only in a snaffle. She doesn't need the double bridle anymore. And this has only been a few months since I was there in Norway at the end of the summer. So great work here. This is really just about right. Especially just for going straight. Now you could ask him for a little more lateral work at times, of course. But just to get the horse straight and stretching into the contact, once we get that, that's really what the lateral work is for, remember. So once we get this, now we have a position from which the horse will build muscle. And we can build a foundation, so to speak. And we can build our house. Just like building a house, you can't build a very good house without a good foundation. It's going to fall apart. And, of course, that's what happens to so many people trying to train horses today is they ignore the horse's physical difficulties and just keep going and going and eventually they run into a wall that they can't get through and they end up throwing the horse away because they can't. It's amazing how many horses today get blamed for being bad horses when the only thing that's wrong with them is whatever's been done to them by humans. So I find very few horses are really bad horses by nature. In fact, I've never met one yet that wasn't able to be turned around. And that's including some pretty uh, rough customers who take your arm off if they had the chance. But if they learn to trust people, this is what you end up with. A horse that's willing to do the work. So this is just a wonderful rhythm in this stretch here going around. I couldn't be happier with this. That's exactly how you'd like it to be. 
Now, she hasn't done a whole lot of riding on this horse, she says, yet, but she's certainly on, on the track to getting there. And that's kind of the whole point of this system is, you know, to do everything in a sense, or a lot of what we do, before we get up. We certainly get out of the way of the things that are going to cause difficulties. In other words, we don't ride a horse until it actually accepts the contact with the bridle. We don't ride them until they're stretching in the walk. We don't ride them at the trot until they're stretching at the trot, or we certainly don't do much of it. Same thing with the canter. So once you understand this, it's a very logical forward progression with horses. Once you actually uh, stop trying to fight them into doing things and simply condition them and let them develop to the point where they can do things, and they do those things without a lot of difficulty. Just like training a person. You know, if you don't give a student, for instance, a good foundation of whatever he's trying to learn, as soon as you get into the more complicated parts, they're just going to be lost. And that's what horses or riders end up doing so often today is they, they get so confused. They're given so many uh, things to do, yet without really the foundation that allows everything else to be easy. So everything becomes very complicated. You know, um, if you're thinking about horses that's very complicated, you're probably not doing it very well. And you're probably just hypothesizing about what's possible. Or you've learned some, some cruel method like roll crane or something like this where people are trying to use their force and some people can get away with that but they only get away with it for a while after a while the horse falls apart and they either they they lose by either losing the horse or most people who ride that way eventually end up getting hurt or just destroying their own bodies because don't forget for instance endlessly sitting to the trot on a horse in a hollow back will not only destroy the horse it will destroy your back as well but this is just absolutely wonderful coming around there you get a little bit leg yield Without any loss of rhythm at all, that's exactly what we'd like to see. So you are literally right now riding this horse from the ground. Doing everything you would do if you were mounted on it. And we can do a lot of that in the walk, and it certainly helps the horses. And hopefully if we've done our job right, and the horse is at least accustomed to having someone on its back, let's just say... When we work young horses, the thing we do, we want to bring them in usually at two, two and a half, three, start them, you know, put tack on them, teach them to lunge, put somebody up a couple of times, and then leave them alone for another year. But you always want to do that early on, backing, and then turn them back out with young babies, because when they get to be three and four and you're backing them, they're a lot stronger. So if they've had somebody on them a few times, uh, you know, in the early days, and then you just forget about that and go back to the, the groundwork, or simply turning them back out, as the case may be. But what a good walk this is. Absolutely fantastic. He hasn't skipped a beat here since you started. Slows down just a little bit there. But not bad. Starts swinging again right there as soon as you ask him to. I'm really rather fascinated by these um, trotting horses that we've run across now in Sweden and Holland. Uh, they're not really a breed that we have over here. Our trotters are, are kind of bigger trotters and a little different type. Um, but these are all really nice and are certainly turning out to have lovely gates. And certainly I see nothing wrong with them. There's certainly no reason why um, they shouldn't be able to easily develop into collection. So the biggest thing that hinders horses is how straight they are behind. And uh, none of these horses that I've run into have been particularly straight. I mean, more so than... Uh, you know, a lot of the times, if you these heavier type of horses, like when you see Percheron crosses and things like this, they're often very straight behind, as are a lot of the older American breeds, um, Appaloosas and Quarter Horses and these kind of things. But that doesn't mean they can't collect. Only the ones with absolutely no ability to flex their hocks can't ultimately collect. So it's going to be fascinating to watch uh, all these folks that are working with these horses. It's uh, watch them come along and develop into something. Every horse is a little bit different, and that's the thing to always remember. But this system that I'm teaching you all work, will work with any horse as long as we recognize. And a lot of the bigger breeds simply, and especially horses if they've been bred outside, uh, are bred uh, not developed correctly, that is, so to speak, in, in when they're young. You know, they come to us as very immature. That is, they if they've been raised in small pens or things like that, haven't gotten enough exercise, they have a very undeveloped look to them when they're babies. You know, they kind of, well, they look like babies when they're three and four years old instead of looking like a mature horse because when they graze, when they're young, that grazing, constant moving grazing, pulls the withers up to the shoulders and uh, finishes the growing of the horse. But if horses aren't out on pasture where they're grazing, 
Um, they could even be in a thousand, uh, you know, acre thing. If it's, there's no grass in it, and there's just a feed thing someplace, well, they're just going to stand around the feedlot. It's not the same as having real pasture. So how they develop is an important thing when they're young. But if they haven't, then we have to replace all that ourselves. In other words, if we, you know, a three-year-old, four-year-old comes to us who's been raised in a little pen as basically a couch potato horse has never done anything in his life, you really have to do this work. It's very important to be stretching. It's very different than if, uh, for instance, observing Mr. Oliveira in Portugal, you know, he would start horses that they'd be four and five year old, fully developed stallions that had been out in pasture their whole lives. So, you know, really physically developed. As are a lot of the horses that, you know, the very expensive horses that come from Europe and from good breeders, most good breeders at least know that, that the horses need to be out, even if they try to force them into false frames when they're young to try to sell them. But most good breeders at least understand that horses need to be raised out and on big pastures where they're moving all the time. But it was interesting to me and a very telling thing. I was having a conversation with Joao Oliveira one time when he first moved to America here and uh, just saying to him, you know, that I would really like to have seen him take some modern warm bloods and do what they do with them, um, you know, to kind of prove the point, so to speak. And uh, Joao looked at me and very honestly said, you know, I wouldn't know how to train one. And I realized, you know, thinking about it, that it's really the developmental part of that. You know, these guys wouldn't be used to having, they bring these big stallions in, they lunge them for a few days, you know, they get right over their backs and, and they can ride away on them pretty soon. But most of us don't have those kind of horses. They either, either they weren't developed correctly or they're, they're undeveloped, whatever the case may be. So we have to take a lot more time. And that's something that we need to figure into what we do when we think about how long it's going to train to, horse, to train a horse, you know. The way we're training horses here is the actual fastest way to actually get the job done. But a lot of people come to this, you know, not realizing or with horses that actually are infirm, that actually need, you know, healing time. For instance, a horse like Bailador, it took us two years really to get him even sound enough to ride. Um, same thing with Contigo. By virtue of taking a lot, a lot of time, he now at 25 years old is now really rideable and really sound. So... A lot of people just simply aren't willing to take that kind of time or that if you talk to them, they think that's a long time. Now, if you start this system with a baby who's not upside down and well-developed, you know, you're going to find it's going to be over its back in a few days and you'll be riding away in not long a period of time. But if a horse is already sway back, if it's already run 40 races like this one and been running upside down, it's going to take a little time. But on the other hand, look how far, for instance, this horse has come since I was there at the, at the end of summer. He doesn't even look like the same horse. If you go back and look at that other one, the saddle, how dipped he was behind the saddle. So this is really rather wonderful work here for him and puts him right on track. Some of the people working with some of these trotters have written to me saying that the ones that are still uh, running have come back, you know, saying, oh my goodness, the horse ran faster than it's ever, or trotted faster than it's ever gone before. Well, of course it did, because it's over its back. You know, all good horsemen know the same thing. I had a I used to be very good friends with John Simpson, who was the greatest harness racing trainer and, and uh, driver of all time. He and his son, between the two of them, have won the Hamletonian uh, 11 times. Um, and they're the biggest breeders of standard bred horses in the world. And I had many conversations with him about how a horse you know, is supposed to move over its back. So as I said, uh, you've heard me say many times before, my experience is that all great horsemen know the same thing, whether they can even express it in the same way. But I think, for instance, in our world today, it's been necessary to talk to people like in terms of mechanics and things like this because it t tends to help them understand because they're not around you know, horses all the time. They're not seeing horses. They're not, you know, as the public, we don't revere horses uh, enough that people are generally interested. I mean, we turned our back on horses at the end of World War II here in America um, and it all became a mechanized society. You know, some of us certainly still want to ride horses, but... That's part of, of uh, how difficult it is to get back to it. You know, after we lost so much after World War II, and we lost a lot of great trainers who actually knew what they were doing and had all that experience. So it's almost like everything started all over again after World War II. People had to figure out, you know, because there weren't great masters to ride with. I mean, they were here and there, but believe me, they were few and far between because I looked. And they're still few and far between. So this has just been really great walk work all along here, just flowing along, no problem whatsoever. And you can see how well this horse has developed.
Now under saddle, look, we go right to the exact same walk practically that we left off with the, in the work in hand. So that's absolutely fantastic. The horse is calm and swinging. Once again, notice that she's only in a snaffle bridle now. So this is a huge improvement of what we saw only a few months back. Lovely rhythm in that. And that's exactly what you'd want. This is what you'd want. You know, at the point at which you start riding a horse without lunging it, you should be able to get on and do just what you're seeing here within a few minutes. If you can't, you know that your groundwork really has not been sufficient and you need to continue doing the lunging before you ride. So in other words, if you can lunge and then get up and ride and you get this right away, then that's exactly, exactly what you're looking for. Um, if you get on the back of the horse and he's all over the place and not accepting the bridle, you know, you're just asking for a fight. So the point here in this system is to avoid these kind of fights by developing the horse physically and understanding that most uh, difficulties start when people ask horses to do things they physically can't do. You know, even a horse, for instance, being run around over big fences, which they seem to, you know, jump willingly. But if you actually look at most horses running around jumping free, they're usually in a bit of a panic in their minds. And once again, you can't really control how the horse jumps. So I, I consider free jumping to be one of the biggest scams going as a way of selling horses. I mean, almost all horses look pretty good when you get them excited enough and race them over some fences. That They take big giant fences and over jump everything. And that looks fancy to people who don't know what they're looking at, but don't ever be fooled by that. I never judge a horse's jumping style unless I see somebody on it first. I mean, yes, you can get an idea how the horse could naturally jump, especially, but only really if you have an idea of really what it looks like when horses jump over the back, not just when they jump because they're excited to be running around a ring with people chasing them with whips. But obviously, no chasing necessary with this one today. It's just flowing along absolutely beautifully. Your position looks good on the back of the horse. All that's improved. Really good stretch there. Really good swing in the walk. Now, of course, the same thing holds true when we start doing the trot work. If you can't get the stretch within a few moments of starting the trot work, you're going to go back to the walk. I mean, you might remember to always start that on a circle. The circle helps you keep the horse in the outside rein. So the horse is always going to get good on a circle before it's going to get good going straight. So we always have to get the horse lifting its back, really, before we bother to even get off a circle and try to get anything out of the horse in terms of moving up into the trot. But they will. In other words, when they're strong enough, one day you'll just put the legs on and send them forward, and the horse will stay right there, just like the horse stayed right there. You know, you got him right back to the same rhythm as you had when you were working on the lunge line. That's absolutely fantastic. And if you look at how long, go back and look at that early um, video that we made back at the clinic here of this horse, and you can see how shortened the neck is. The horse actually looks like its neck is two feet longer now, doesn't it? Because it's not turtling the neck back into the body. And of course, you can just visualize what happens here. If you pull the neck up and brace it backwards and upwards, what happens is blocking the shoulders. The shoulders can't even swing through. Once again, that's what creates that phony kind of flipping of the front legs, is by pulling the neck up and back in so you pull basically the base of the neck against the top of the shoulder so that's what makes the horse have that phony kind of flip out in front but remember if the horse isn't coming through to the same degree behind you are doing great damage to your horse so in, in real dressage no matter how collected the horse is the hind leg still swings through on the same plane as the front leg it just lowers the hindquarters But remember, real collection is more about the thrust, that is the thrust of the hind leg lifting and pushing up into that round back that lifts the horse off the ground. That's what real collection is. It has nothing to do with shortening the stride or having the horse snap its legs up. Which unfortunately seems to be what uh, most people today call dressage. And it really is a pity because I know, like Emily here, there are many of you out there that, you know, really, even if you went down that road for a while, you were all sensitive enough to leave that road or you got smart enough after your trainer ruined your horse 
or something like this. It just amazes me how many people will let the same trainer ruin horse after horse and buy the same nonsense story that there's something wrong with the horse after they ruin it and talk them into buying another one. I mean, to me, that's just kind of, you know, <laughs> how much intelligence does it take? How many times do you have to get burnt before you say no? And once again, until people start walking away from these kind of trainers, you know, they're going to stay in business. So I, once again, encourage everyone. For instance, if you're going out to, to think of, oh, I want to ride, I've heard about somebody and you say they're good, well, go and watch them. Like, all, you're all welcome to come by my barn any time and spend a month here if you like watching what we do before you take a lesson. So any trainer who won't let you come and watch what they do for a week, you know, before you sign up with them, you know, you definitely don't want to sign up with. Just know that. So when you go out looking for trainers, go spend a week. It doesn't cost you a dime. And if they won't let you come and watch them train, you certainly wouldn't want to train with them. Or if they won't let you take pictures of them or videotape them while they're training. You know, obviously there's something that they want to hide, just like at all horse shows now. You know, all videotaping and photography is against the rules, or against the law of the ground, so to speak. So again, our, our horse organizations are only protecting the riders anymore. They're not protecting horses, they're protecting the riders from the spectators and, and you know, of people finding out what's really going on. If they weren't afraid of that, they wouldn't put up walls around the warm-up arena these days. Because the warm-up tells you the whole story. While the FEI keeps saying that there's no abused horses and you know that none of this is going on, we all know that it is because we've seen all the clips. But this is a beautiful trot, and just like we said before, this horse just moved right up into this stretching trot, and that means it's ready to trot, just like that. Now here it could get a little bit lower, as it does right there. And you can clearly see a difference. I mean, if you go back and once again and even look at this horse's form, how much more up his belly is, there's not nearly as big a hole behind the saddle there as you're rising to the trot. And he's actually seeming to develop a little bit of thrust now. That is, the hind leg is actually pushing you forward instead of him just pulling with his shoulders at this point. But this is beautiful, and obviously notice the horse is no longer running. She no longer needs a double bridle to hold the horse back. In fact, the only way to stop a problem horse from doing that is simply, as you have learned, to let go of the mouth and forget about training the mouth, which is what so many people are doing when they're trying to ride horses. It's all about, you know, forcing the head and neck to do something, forcing the horse to stop with your hands um, against the mouth, this kind of thing. Someone wrote the other day about, you know, oh, well, I'm practicing stopping and you know, what was happening with the horse, and don't practice stops, you know, one should even practice, uh, I practice one halt a day with my horses, and, you know, as far as practicing, and that's at the end of the lesson, and that even must be appropriate, so in other words, at this level of training, someone, you're going through the gears, in other words, if you go from a stop, you go to a walk, you go from a walk to a trot, from a trot to a canter, if you're doing so, you don't leave anything out, so a horse at this level would come back to a walk before it would halt, you never want anything to be abrupt, you know, when you see these Western riders doing this abusive sliding stop stuff and running horses into walls, I find it amazing, once again, that the FEI now has let this reining stuff, you know, be part of the world equestrian games. It's nothing but abuse. These horses last, you know, if a horse only lasts two long years in what they're doing, um, there's something seriously wrong with what you're doing. I mean, if you're riding dressage and you're constantly pulling tendons and and suspensories and all of these kinds of things, you should be asking yourself, what are you doing? Because a good dressage rider, even a horse that's not over its back, I mean, it's over its back, you know, you don't need the best footing in the world because the horse is like a four-wheel drive car, so to speak, and it can go right over difficulties. The people today are so obsessed with footing because, you know, if their horses do anything, they, they, uh, they pull a suspensory because they're so out of balance. Really good stretch here, though. This is just such an improvement over what we saw. Once again, go back and uh, look at the first little video of this horse at the last clinic, just trying to learn how to do this and how stiff he was. And how far we've come since then. You know, as you have all heard me say many times, if you can reasonably walk and trot a horse, walk, trot and canter a horse, and you're not afraid of it, important part there. If you're afraid of a horse, you shouldn't be working with it. You should work with horses that are at your level, so to speak, because um, some of them are just too much for some people. A lot of that has to do with, you know, how fast you are, things like that, developing the right kind of uh, instincts around horses that, you know, that you must build up slowly. No one should throw themselves into working a horse that's too difficult for them too soon. So in other words, as I was saying, you can't be afraid of a horse and train it. So if you can do this, just like uh, Emily has done here, she brought this horse along beautifully. 
well on the way, a year from now, this horse will look like an, a totally different horse. That back, that the hollow that you see in the back there will totally be gone. Now you can see how relaxed the underside of the neck is, and that's just what we want. That means the top line is going to be developing when you can see this. This is pretty much, a for this horse's level of developing, as good a working trot as I think you're going to get right now, and it will just continue to, to get better and better. But my point is you're, you're doing the part that is important. This is the, you're, you've got the horse doing and developing, and that will make everything else easier. Once again, a, a correctly trained dressage horse does not become harder to ride. It becomes easier to ride. They respond to the finesse and the accuracy of the aids, not to whether they're being forced into the aids or not. And that's a good way to tell a horse that's been correctly trained, that is, an upper level horse will not go crazy just because somebody gets on it who has, you know, uh, a little tightened leg or something like this because they'll just ignore it because it isn't accurate. So it isn't going to upset them. Whereas if a beginner gets on one of these horses that's been turned into a neurotic Piaf and passage machine through ropering, you notice how some of these roker advocates, you know, they, even get, they get run away within the ring if the crowd applause because they're always in pain all the time. So that's why they freak out when they hear the applause because they're looking for where the next blow is coming from. So once again, real confidence in a horse comes from the horse trusting you. In other words, the horse trust that you're not putting it in some position that, you know, uh, is going to hurt it. So it lets you make the decision. So when it hears a bunch of people applauding or whatever the case may be, it doesn't just freak out going, okay, here comes another blow, so to speak. They just relax about everything. So this has been really good work with this horse. You notice when his head comes up there, once in a while it becomes a little, little irregular. It looks to me like now he's starting to get a little tired here. You can see he's actually starting to pull a little bit more with his shoulders. He's starting to look a little bit on the tired side here. And you do want to sort of get to that point, but when you get to that point, then, then you want to back off and just let him walk again, which is what she does here in a few moments. So I'd say this work here out was just about right for this horse today. Yeah, a really good stretch there. So when he gets to there, you just want to ask him to just come that little bit more active and keep him there, that little more active, even though you feel like, like I, I can see watching this, that he's just trying to slack off a little bit. He's getting a little tired here. As I said, I'm starting to see more, a little more pull, even though he's stretched than, than I saw as, as much push behind. Now that gets a little better. As soon as he gets that neck out there just a little bit more, you can see a little more reach and a little more activity. Now, could you say this horse is on the forehand? Well, of course he's on the forehand. This horse is just beginning this work, but he won't stay on the forehand. This work will develop him off of the forehand. But he's l certainly less on the forehand than he'd ever be if his head were up in the air. That's the thing to realize. Bringing the horse's head up in the air does not mean the horse is not on the forehand. Every saddle bred in the world, even though they raise their knees practically up to their chins, their heads are way up in the air, but they're completely on the forehand because there's absolutely no thrust in the gait at all. And that's the whole point. That's what gated people do. They make horses that are easy the idea of gating a horse is so there's no movement in the back. So a rider who doesn't know how to ride can sit there and take the little park ride. And remember that you know the park seat, saddle seat, was started actually in New York City in the late 1800s, the beginning of the uh, industrial mobilization, so to speak, when we had a big middle class for the first time and they wanted to do something. So this guy trained horses for Central Park in New York. That's why they called it the park seat. And he trained these horses with hollow backs so that these beginner weekend, when ride, weekend riders could come out, get on, and you know, trot around and have a little ride in the country or so they think. But however, that would never do if you had to ride to the next town, as my father used to always say when he'd see a hollow-backed horse, he'd always say, you never go to the next town, you never make it to the next town riding like that. Because he actually grew up in a time, my father was born in 1904 and was a professional trainer up, to, up until the beginning of World War II. Really good stretch here. Got a little more energy there. A little harder in one direction for him the other. But everything you're doing here is exactly right. He's exactly most of the time in the speed that you want him to be at. You're working him for an appropriate length of time. He's completely unstressed and relaxed. He's got in the zone it is. It's so wonderful when we ride horses. Once you get used to riding horses in the zone, I mean, if you spent your whole life, you know, as many of of us did, and, and myself even. You know, my father taught me to ride like this, and then I went to college, and I was the college show jumping captain, and that sort of thing, and started tra training with these trainers who trained the way these other people do today, and I finally just walked away from it. But really great job here with this. You have done a wonderful job. This horse is hugely improved over what I saw. 
you have a really good talent for this and you're right on track. So I really look forward to, uh, to seeing you all again next year when I'm in Norway. We're looking forward to it. Remember, everybody, we're having our week-long, um, nine-day, actually, long clinic in, in, in Norway next year. It should be great. See you then.